Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's EMSA Learn webinar on using nuclear magnetic resonance for analyzing molecules and mixtures. We are so glad that you could join us today. The next three EMSA Learn webinars are going to focus on call topics for our upcoming call for proposals that are opening in December. So in November, uh, we have two. Uh, one will highlight call topics and available capabilities that are focused in the biological space. And the other will focus on available capabilities um, in the environmental research space. And on December 7th, uh, we will highlight call topics and available computing focused capabilities. So uh, more information will be provided through our social media channels and via email about these upcoming opportunities. Make sure to keep in touch with EMSL um, so that you can get all these notifications by subscribing to our email and our social media channels if you haven't already. The links will be provided in the chat. So today, John Court will introduce NMR and walk through NMR for small molecule determination, um, including natural products and specialized and primary metabolites. Shavidin Kelladin, or I'm sorry, Clendian, uh, will show how to use NMR for metabolomics. Gary Buchko will provide details on using NMR to characterize the structure, dynamics, and interactions of biological macromolecules. And Andy Lipton will discuss NMR for analyzing crystalline and amorphous materials. There will be time at the end of today's webinar for questions. So we encourage you to post your questions in the Zoom chat and John, Shavian, uh, Gary, and Andy will answer them during our Q&A. So with that, we'll begin with John. Thank you. Okay, so um, I wanna begin by introducing NMR spectroscopy a little bit. And um, this is gonna be really brief, but uh, what I wanna say is that the nuclei of um, some atoms have a non-zero spin quantum number, um, which means that they have uh, discrete states, uh, discrete energy states in the presence of an external magnetic field. And we can probe the differences between those energy states uh, uh, with radio frequency radiation. Um, the simplest um, atomic nucleus um, has a spin state uh, of um, plus or minus one half. And some of the most interesting um, nuclei for biochemistry um, are, are spin one half nuclei. Uh, and some examples are shown up here. Um, uh, the ones I'm going to talk about today are um, hydrogen, and we often say proton, uh, but we mean hydrogen, um, and C13. So um, protons um, have have um, high natural abundance. Uh, C13 does not. It's about only 1% natural abundant, uh, but it's still sufficient for us to work with. Uh, the others, N15, for example, uh, has very low abundance, um, but we can enrich with N15 uh, in the case of proteins, as you'll hear about later from Gary Buchko. Uh, fluorine 19 and um, phosphorus 31 are also 100% natural abundant. Um, but the way the NMR experiment works, or the way we do it these days, is we use broadband radio frequency uh, pulses, very short uh, high power pulses um, that tip the bulk magnetization vector into the transverse plane. Then we turn off the radio frequency radiation and we let the magnetization vector process, uh, which means it just um, uh, 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 circulates about the z-axis and relaxes back to the z-axis. Um, during that process, um, the different nuclei in different positions, uh, different environments in a molecule process at slightly different frequencies. And um, that's shown in this, uh, in this diagram here on the right. Um, the way that we detect the signal is basically with a coil, uh, a metal coil. Um, and because this is a magnet uh, that's turning, uh, processing uh, in a coil, it induces a current in the coil. And that's what we detect. That's a signal that we detect. 
and that's called the free induction decay, which is shown uh, here. Um, it's basically a superposition of all the different discrete frequencies um, that are being detected. And so it's a, it's a plot of uh, a decaying oscillating signal um, over time. Uh, we can't really interpret that, but we can do a Fourier transform, which converts that amplitude versus time signal to a frequency versus intensity. Uh, and that's what's shown here. And that's the NMR spectrum that we're used to looking at. Uh, and by interpreting that data, we can figure out lots of interesting things like the structures of small molecules, of proteins, interactions between small molecules and proteins, and we can look at mixtures. Um, on the left here, I'm showing a picture um, of an NMR instrument. It's basically a, a, a magnet in a big thermos bottle because we have to keep it very cold. Um, there's some computers that run it and then some uh, uh, people, uh, this uh, person on the left is putting a sample into the magnet. Um, so uh, if you took organic chemistry, you might remember seeing um, um, some uh, 1D spectra like I'm showing here. Uh, this is the uh, proton and carbon spectrum of ethanol, a very simple molecule. And um, it's possible to determine structures of molecules from uh, 1D spectra. Um, these days we, we use some other uh, methods that I'll show in a minute, uh, but we can use these 1D spectra to show the basic um, information that we can collect with NMR that helps us understand uh, structures of molecules and uh, to understand mixtures as, as we'll hear later. Um, and so the, the four things that I want to point out are, one is the um, this frequency axis, uh, the x-axis, it's in a normalized frequency scale called PPM, um, um, which we also call chemical shift. It's not PPM like lead in your drinking water. It's um, it's just a normalized frequency uh, uh, scale um, so that we can compare data from um, instruments that we're operating at different magnetic field strengths. Um, but that information, that frequency information is very valuable for understanding the different types of atoms in a molecule. So for example, if a molecule has um, a carbon atom with an oxygen attached to it, uh, the frequency of that carbon and the attached protons will have uh, distinct uh, chemical shifts on this scale. Um, aliphatic, um, uh, aliphatic atoms, um, carbons and hydrogens will appear at a different place. Aromatics have a little region of their own. Uh, and so that's very valuable information when we're trying to solve a structure. Um, some other information that's, that's quite useful is um, this fine structure in some of these peaks. Um, gives us information about the connectivity of atoms. And that's because um, in NMR, uh, nuclei that are uh, close to each other through a network of bonds uh, can talk to each other in a quantum mechanical way. And that causes this splitting. So um, one of these peaks is a quartet. There's a four peak pattern called a quartet. And that's giving us information about the uh, three atoms that are on the carbon next to the carbon that has um, uh, that's responsible for this peak. And this other one is a triplet, and that's that's information about the connectivity. Um, we also get quantitative information. With NMR, we essentially count the spins, um, and that's really useful for metabolomics, as we'll hear later. And then we get information about dynamics. And um, I'm not going to talk too much about dynamics, but there's a whole lot of um, different ways we can understand molecular dynamics by looking at um, some different relaxation processes with NMR. And um, we also can find information about chemical exchange. Um, and that's exemplified uh, in this, in this um, slide by the line width of this um, hydroxyl proton, but it's actually um, quite a bit more complicated than that. Um, so on the next slide, I'm showing uh, how we can um, use that information about connectivity in the way that um, I mentioned that uh, nuclei can talk to each other um, in a quantum mechanical way. And that enables us to do these 2D experiments. So we basically label uh, one frequency with the frequency of another atom that's related to it in some um, defined way uh, that we can detect using um, multi-pulse uh, NMR experiments that have precisely timed pulses and delays in between them that um, help uh, figure out these correlations. And so I'm showing three of the main ways that, um, or three of the main experiments that we use. Um, they have funny names like COSY HSQC and HMBC. 
And the, the connectivity is shown by the underlying atoms. So in, in COSY, we detect um, uh, protons that are correlated with other protons through three bonds. So proton, carbon, carbon, proton. The HSQC is a one bond proton carbon correlation. And the HMBC is a multiple bond proton carbon correlation, usually through three bonds, but also sometimes through two or four. Um, there are a couple of other experiments that I'm not showing. Um, and this information together with the 1D spectra and with some uh, knowledge of chemical shift ranges, and usually we'll have the mass of a molecule. All that information together, um, if you understand these rules, can be used to solve the structure of a molecule. And in this case, with this data that I'm showing here, you would be able to figure out that the molecule uh, was sucrose. Um, so that's a pretty simple example. Um, but I want to mention that it's really important to understand the structures of molecules. And in chemistry, we, we need to understand the structure because the structure determines the function and the reactivity. Um, before NMR was invented, there were several different ways of determining structure. And I'm showing some here. Um, some of these like degradative um, structure elucidation, we don't really use anymore, but we certainly use X-ray diffraction uh, for, for solving structures of molecules. Um, but, but nowadays, most um, new molecules um, have their structures determined with NMR spectroscopy. And in the world of specialized metabolites um, or natural products, they're called sometimes, about 4,000 of these are, are identified each year. Um, and the vast majority of them uh, with NMR spectroscopy. And this is just an example that I pulled out of the literature at random, um, but you can see it's got those same experiments that I described. Um, um, in this case, they're looking at also the biosynthesis of the compound. Um, there's some of the same spectra that I showed. Um, and then they have this table of chemical shifts, which are the assignment of specific atoms in the molecule um, to the peaks in the spectra that essentially proves the structure um, by, by way of uh, um, logic and inference in the interpretation of the data. Um, so I want to show now a couple examples of structures that were actually solved at EMSL um, uh, through an EMSL user project. And it, it's, again, the same sets of spectra that I showed uh, for that sucrose example. Um, and this happened to be a compound that came from a plant um, growing in the Philippines that a collaborator isolated and found to have some interesting properties. And they wanted to know what the, what the um, structure of this compound was. So I got this data. It was really nice data. I spent an afternoon uh, determining the structure. And I got this structure, which happened um, to be pretty interesting looking. Um, but I Googled the um, molecular formula, which I had from mass spectrometry, and found that it was a it was a known uh, compound um, called coroneridine that had been published um, in a Brazilian uh, journal in 2008. Um, but the chemical shifts that were published in that article matched exactly the carbon chemical shifts that I had. That's they only had the carbon shifts in this paper. Um, so what I what I did essentially was um, it's called dereplication. So I I demonstrated that the isolated compound was something that had already been identified. Um, it would have been nice to search a database um, and find that compound, but um, there, there, there is no such database. And I'll, I'll say something about that in a minute. Um, so there's one more uh, compound here. And sorry, my slide is being slow to advance. OK. Um, so this is a compound that was isolated from the same plant. It was just in a different fraction, but the data wasn't quite as good. Probably the concentration was lower and I couldn't solve the structure. Um, I could get a partial structure and it looked like it was also one of these Iboga alkaloids, um, but um, it, there wasn't the data wasn't good enough. Um, I could still measure all the carbon chemical shifts. And if there had been a database that I could search that had all the known natural product um, um, NMR data, then that might have enabled me to identify this compound or to conclude that it um, didn't exist uh, and it was a new compound. And um, that brings me to this. So this isn't an EMSL project, but it actually has used some EMSL resources. Um, this is an NIH funded project that I work on and I, I'm the PI of it. And this is um, making a database of all natural products and specialized metabolites NMR data. So it's both um, published data and also 
um, raw data that people deposit. Um, a lot of funding agencies and journals are going to start requiring raw data deposition. And you can um, go to this website or scan this QR code or um, just Google for NPMRD and learn more about this database. Um, I want to mention another thing about structure determination uh, when we don't really have ideal data. And that's that we can actually calculate um, um, NMR data uh, chemical shifts, and we can also um, um, uh, simulate spectra pretty well. And that's helpful um, in hypothesis testing. So if you have some data that's not so good, like I showed, and you might have some ideas about what the structure might be, you can uh, uh, calculate the chemical shifts and see if they match the ones that you measured. In, in your spectra that you were able to get. And um, this does use um, the uh, software developed at EMSL called NWChem, the, some very important um, quantum chemistry software that's very widely used. And my colleagues, um, whose names are shown down here, um, have developed something called Icicle, which is a pipeline uh, of different software that's put together in a convenient way so that it is easy to run, uh, that does um, all the calculations necessary um, to um, accurately um, calculate and predict um, NMR chemical shifts, um, as, as well as some other information that might be useful. Um, some of that's shown here. Um, so I want to show now uh, an example of how we can use predicted chemical shifts to um, identify molecules. So this is a sample, again, um, isolated from a plant on an island in the Philippines. Uh, we had uh, limited amounts of this sample. Um, we could tell from the data, which is some of which is shown on the left, that we had a major component, which is a novel germacrine dione, a sesquiterpenoid that was interesting. Um, but we could also see that um, there were some minor peaks, and they weren't just impurities, they were actually a um, subspectrum of another compound that hadn't been purified away. And uh, we determined the connectivity of that molecule to be this known molecule called corimbolone. Um, but the NMR data didn't match exactly. So, um, so the, all the atoms were connected in the same way, but the chemical shifts, the, the frequencies um, of the different atoms weren't exactly the same. And so that suggested that we might have a um, different stereoisomer of this molecule. And we predicted chemical shifts for the four epimers of this. So just taking one of the four um, uh, stereocenters and uh, flipping it. And we didn't get any good matches there, uh, so we changed two of the stereocenters and got um, this uh, compound, which has a the um, the two rings are fused in a, a cis way, so it's a cis decalin framework instead of a trans decalin. And using some software called DP4 Plus, uh, we were able to determine that those predictions uh, fit the best. And our conclusion is that we've identified a new stereoisomer of corymbolone, which actually would be a different molecule because it has a different shape. Uh, this work was done by Robert Young, mostly um, from Emsel, um, and it's it's a, a really nice example. Um, there's uh, one last thing I want to say, which is we can, with NMR, not only determine structures, but we can also correct uh, wrong structures. So in the literature, there are a lot of incorrect structures that have been published, and um, uh, I'm showing one here that we uh, again, identified in a in a, one of these plant samples from the Philippines. Um, it turned out to be um, um, this was published back in 1992 as coming from a, a plant from the same genus. Um, but we had data suggesting that this um, was the wrong structure, and we were able to were able to show that the right structure was this molecule, which was also known called tryptanthrin. And we used predicted chemical shifts to um, es essentially prove that and uh, uh, correct the record. So now we know the right structure of this um, interesting molecule that has biological activity from this plant. Um, so that's the end of uh, what I want to say. And um, Chevian will um, say uh, talk about metabolomics next. Hi, everyone. My name is Chavian Kalendinen, and I'm a chemist here at EMSOL. And I'm going to be talking about um, EMSOL's um, NMR metabolomics capability. 
So first, um, to get everyone on the same page, metabolomics is the identification and quantitation of metabolites in biological systems. And what I mean when I say metabolite, um, they are small molecule intermediates and products of the metabolism. And so the metabolome is the complete set of these small molecules. And some of the biological systems that I'll be talking um, that we can study include, but it's not limited to soil, plants, um, different um, fungi and bacteria and water systems. So, um, so John Court uh, elaborated on this a lot, but just to recap, um, we for metabolomics, we largely do liquid NMR and it's important to know that it's non-destructive. So your samples are safe with NMR and it detects the small molecules in the sample due to the absorption and emission of um, electromagnetic radiation by nuclei. And some of the sensitive nuclei um, include um, proton, but we can also measure C13 and 15 and others. Um, we can work with almost every type of sample, um, but samples with high amounts of paramagnetics um, tend to be less compatible with this um, technology. Um, so, John showed you a lot of spectra of um, purified single compounds. And so with metabolomics, we tend to work with mixtures. So I have an example here of what these various amino acids and sugar would look like in a 1D proton spectra like John showed you um, if we were to measure them on their own. And for these four molecules, and I, the space here just represents the water region that I kind of took out for simplicity. Um, so if you look at these, um, in a mixture of these molecules, you can see that as a mixture, it becomes more complex, but that the signals are all still there and they're still measurable and can be deconvoluted to identify um, the particular metabolite. Again, we can, NMR can accommodate almost every sample type with little to no processing. And so we can take extracted and dried samples that can be re-suspended in deuterate solvents like D2O. Um, one of the um, extraction methods that we use here a lot at the lab is called MPLEX. Not gonna go too much detail into that. Um, and or organic um, solvent extraction or just simple water washes will do. Um, but Due to its limited um, need for a sample prep, NMR can detect and quantify metabolites that can be missed with other um, technologies that we have. Um, and that's because it doesn't have, it, your sample doesn't need to be dried down prior to analysis. So a lot, a lot of these dissolved um, VOCs, for example, such as methanol, isopropanol, isopropanol acetone can be quantified and detect, detected and quantified, um, but also small molecular weight compounds such as formic acid and acetic acid that tend to be outside of the mass range of a lot of our mass spectrometers um, can also be easily um, detected and quantified using NMR. It's also more salt tolerant than a lot of our methods. So there's no need for additional sample preparation such as SPE, um, solid phase extraction. And um, it's re it can readily distinguish isomers such as sugar isomers and many amino acids and other isomers like that. Taking a minute to go to the next slide. So one of the most exciting things about NMR for metabolomics is this isotope tracer analysis, which is relatively straightforward. So um, oftentimes detecting um, low levels of C13 isotope enrichment can be um, enrichment of metabolites in these complex mixtures can be challenging. And so one of the many methods that we use to do, um, to do this with NMR is the an improved version of the dispel sequence. And there is a poster reference here. Um, will Q, uh, one of the scientists that I will give you his contact information later is um, also has been working on that. Um, using the spell, we can eliminate signals from C13 bound protons, and then we can take the difference of the two spectra to yield um, um, protons that are only bound to the carbon 13 signal. So as you can see here for this molecule, what we, ha what we have here are, as the dark is the labeled molecule, you can see that we can detect labeling at different sites based on the the 
the coupling of that the, these protons to those um, particular C13 nuclei. But also we can take a one, regular 1D spectrum, and then we can also take a 1D spectrum with no C13 bound and just subtract those two. And then we can see the diff, these C13 satellites that we call them satellites. Um, we can basically see those and quantify those using carbon-13. And this has already been done here at the lab. This is an example. And the, sorry, apologize for the um, reference being cut off there. So if you need that later, I can definitely um, get that to you. Um, so what basically what this is showing here is that we can look at different, we can, we can isotopically label a system, introduce an isotope label into a system at a particular site on a molecule. In this example, it was pyruvate. And then we can follow where that um, isotope um, goes throughout the biologic, throughout the biological pathways uh, in this example. And we can see the differences and quantify those differences between these different treatments and species. And so this is another example of where you can, this is a simulation, but you can see how the spectra changes as a function of the labeling of any particular molecule. And we can quantify these changes. Um, NMR can do 1D, uh, NMR can ID N15 enrichments, but it is challenging. So we can use other methods. Um, so one of the, methods that we can use is um, LCMS, and we can use LCMS with NMR, and they work very well together. And this example of a user project is one in which um, NMR was able to see that the glutamine and asparagine, um, amide nitrogen, has similar intensities. And the 1D um, profiling of these metabolites showed that there was a 10 times increase in concentration between the asparagine and the glutamine. Whereas the LCMS results here, and the, the blue and the teal represent um, two uh, N15 labeled with two different substrates, so two systems that were labeled with two different substrates, and the orange was unlabeled, so that was natural abundance. And so what it showed was that in some of the samples, blue samples, that we had about a 10 times increase in isotopic enrichment for the um, for for some of the samples compared to asparagine. So NMR, this is one example where NMR was able to work together with other techniques because in LCMS, there really would not have been any way for me to determine that uh, without running standards alongside it, that there is an actual 10 times concentration of um, asparagine compared to glutamine because we don't really compare um, directly um, metabolites within the same sample. So that brings me to the last slide of one of the last slides, I promise. And so no single platform or method can cover the breadth of the metabolome. Um, I, I, I do like when users throw in the, the kitchen sink that they want everything, because really and truly no single method can give you all the answers that you're looking for if you're trying to do something completely untargeted. So what, I really like to show this diagram because really it's all of these methods and I'm not showing everything that we can do here for metabolomics. For example, I'm not showing MALDI um, in this diagram, but we can use NMR and mass spec to really begin to look at the, um, the, the per look at what happened during perturbation of a system it, it, as far as it goes to metabolomics. And then this can be used with other omics platforms such as proteomics. Uh, this is the EMTHOL NMR metabolomics team. Most all of the work that was presented here was done by Robert Young and David Hoyt. And Will Q, Liz, and I, we all, this, the whole team really works very closely together to, um, to really improve, continue to improve our NMR metabolomics capability and provide users with as much information on their samples as possible. So I would, I provided their email addresses here. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to any one of us and we'll be able to um, answer that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm trying to uh, 
even though we practice this, uh, uh, it's not quite working. Oops. Okay. Hi, I don't know if I got control here, but anyways, I'll we'll give it a shot. Uh, hi, my name is Gary Butchko. Uh, over over the multi, many many years, I guess here, I learned how which which buttons to press on the on the NMR spectrometers. So I guess I can call myself an NMR spectroscopist. But uh, as the, I will show you briefly in in the uh, in the next few slides, is that what I really am is really a chemical shift accountant, and that's because. Uh, uh, unlike the molecules that John and Shay has been working on, uh, metabolites and small molecules, those, those things were about a, a kilodalton in size. And what I'm going to talk about is something that's a large, lot bigger, proteins. And generally speaking, proteins are, are they can be between 5 to 10 kilodaltons in size to, you know, 40, 50 kilodaltons in size. And, and basically, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of all the wonderful things you can do with NMR to uh, study proteins. Now, when most of you are thinking about uh, uh, here are the words proteins, NMR and structures. Proteins and NMR, you're probably thinking of NMR, are structures that are determined using NMR techniques. And, and that is the, making the use of these things called nuclear overhauser effects to, uh, that quantitates, uh, uh, that, that, that identifies protons that are near to each other in space. But determining structures by NMR spectroscopy is only the tip of, of the iceberg of all the uh, the information one can obtain about proteins using NMR spectroscopy. And I'm just going to delve by brief, you know, I'm not even get into all these subjects, but NMR can be used to uh, look at binding surfaces uh, on the surfaces of these proteins. They can be used to study uh, protein dynamics at the uh, atomic level. They are used a lot in drug discovery, and there's many different ways it is, it is used in drug discovery. And one technique is called STD NMR. And, and, it's, and it's becoming uh, a more widely used tool for various reasons. Uh, one can add a paragmenetic species to your proteins, and this gives us a lot of uh, nice information on, on the protein as well, especially uh, in terms of studying uh, proteins that have um, metal catalysis, because uh, what, what happens when you add a paragmenetic species to your protein? It makes the chemical shifts go wacky. They spread all over the place and their intensities uh, go up and down. So we can, we can actually use this information to get some information of how metal, metal catalysis works in, in these proteins. Uh, and one other thing I'd like to point out, uh, NMR is also very useful to look at proteins that, have, uh, that are intrinsically disordered. And about 25% of protein space is actually involves intrinsically disordered proteins. And, and NMR is, only, is one of the only techniques really that can actually study this, this, this space that's invisible with other techniques in, in detail. Uh, so, he, uh, so most of you are pro pro probably familiar with this cartoon representation of a protein. These uh, curly things are alpha helices. These uh, long things with arrows, flat arrows, are beta strands. These beta strands and alpha helices fold together to uh, to to make a unique tertiary structure of the protein. And this in this structure at this level. It, it, it is very important and it provides a lot of useful information. But I'd like to remind you that, you know, this, this cartoon is for a 270 residue protein from mycobacteria tuberculosis. But, but you know, this is just a cartoon. In the real world, uh, it's, it's a bunch of atoms. And, and this is actually a simplified uh, view of the atomic structure of the protein because I only include the backbone. I, uh, I eliminated all the side chains uh, for this protein. And you will note that, uh, you know, there's almost 4,000 atoms in this, uh, in, this one, in this one molecule. And of these, you know, about 1,000 of them are carbon, 2,000 hydrogen, and you have about 300 uh, nitrogen atoms. Now, you know, as mentioned earlier by John and Shea, uh, uh, we need to use NMR, we have to have the right, uh, the, the, we have to have nuclei that have the right uh, mag mag magnetic uh, quantum number, magnetic moments. And with protons, this is easy. Everything's protons are, 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 are good for NMR. But carbon and nitrogen, not so. They're not that predominant uh, in, in natural abundance. So if we want to use NMR to study proteins, what we have to do quite often is uh, enrich them in carbon and enrich them in nitrogen. 
And this is uh, easily done, actually. Uh, if anyone is, is expressing proteins in their lab uh, for other studies, it can be done by using what we call minimal media. And, it, and, it, and with this minimal media, the only source of nitrogen and carbon is actually N15 labeled uh, ammonium chloride and c labeled glucose. So your protein is going to be almost 98 to 99% enriched in these two nuclei. And I would like to point out that you know, if, uh, if you want to use NMR to study proteins, uh, we can help you uh, get these uh, labeling protocols uh, in place in your laboratories, or else you can get in touch with us and we'll be happy to, uh, to actually label some of these proteins for, for you and see if, it's, if your protein in particular will, will be amiable to study using uh, various NMR techniques. Uh, now here's uh, the key to studying proteins by NMR spectroscopy. This is the two-dimensional proton nitrogen HSQC spectrum for, for, a, for a protein. Now, each one of these uh, cross peaks that we call represent a specific amide on the backbone of this big protein. Now, you know, this is where the power of, of NMR spectroscopy comes, comes about because all the nuclei, the nitrogens, the hydrogens, the carbons are very sensitive to their molecular environment. So as, as John mentioned, for individual metabolites, uh, you have a unique uh, carbon proton uh, spectra. For proteins as well, you have a unique uh, proton nitrogen, for instance, a, a spectrum as well for, for each different protein because the backbone of, of most proteins are a little bit different. And if you tweak things uh, a little bit, the environment will change and the position of these these dots will change and, and, and that's and that's where the power of, of our of our technique comes into play and and i just put this here to, to remind you that this is you know this is the fingerprint the spectrum here is a fingerprint not only for small molecules but for big molecules now you know, how do we do this well again as mentioned earlier uh different nuclei have different nu uh, quantum numbers and they interact uh, uh, quantum mechanically in unique ways. And one of the uh, attributes of this is something called coupling constants. And without going into details, we, uh, people uh, in the past, we call these people uh, pulse jockeys, they use this, uh, th this behavior uh, to actually make a, a, a bunch of pulse programs that allow us to, uh, to actually identify all the carbon, proton, and nitrogen chemical shifts in, in a protein. And, and it's done most, you know, primarily shown here in a slice of a three-dimensional spectrum by allowing us to connect uh, uh, cross peaks to, to each other. And, and by, by using all these fancy programs that the, that, the, that the pulse jockeys made, we are able to actually become what we call chemical shift accountants and actually assign all the carbons, and protons, and nitrogens to our big, big molecules. And, and I'll just give you a little example here. You know, after you do this, you know, things become a, a lot more easier. All the other things we can do underneath the uh, NMR iceberg are simpler. And this is just one example. Uh, this is basically the same protein that I showed you earlier. Uh, in green is the native protein. No, in red is the native protein. And in green, we've added this uh, nucleotide analog called 2-methyl adenosine to it. And you can see that for a few of the, the uh, amides, uh, the cross peaks shifted. And you know, in the primary amino sequence of the protein, they vary a lot. Here we have glycine 111, here we have valine 15, for instance. But if you take all these amides and you map them onto the structure of the protein, you see they coalesce in, in, in one particular uh, spot on, on the protein surface. So, so this is identifying where this small molecule is binding on, on the surface of the big protein. Now, in a similar fashion, because we know all these atomic positions, we can look at, at the dynamics of individual, uh, you know, uh, methyl groups on various locations of the protein because we've identified it. And this is done by a suite of fancy pulse programs, uh, thanks to these uh, pulse jockeys that I've made up, and these are the names they've given for them. But we can we can use these techniques to study protein folding, ligand binding, catalysis. Uh, we can look at diffusion, and as I just briefly mentioned, we can look at uh, at, at, at motion uh, of individual uh, atoms. And this is because NMR is sensitive to a, a wide range of time scales and, and, and allowing us to you know, uh, get a lot of information on these proteins. Because in the end, what we want to figure out 
we know we know where the structure knowing the structures of these proteins are important, but we want to understand how these proteins do things. You know, on the molecular level, you know how how are these how are these proteins catalyzing the the making and the breaking of individual bonds that are producing all the metabolites, for instance, that uh, Shay and John talked about previously. So in a, in a, you know a world when that's you know that's the protein world, but there are also other big molecules in in, in biology. Uh, probably the next biggest is the nucleic acid world. We've got things like RNA ribozymes and DNA aptamers, and and all the techniques that we've used to study proteins, we could also use to study uh, nucleic acids as well. Now, now, and in closing, I would just like to say, you know, this is the solution NMR world. Proteins are uh, also can work in the solid state, and for that, we'll have Andy tell us all the wonderful things that can be done, not only proteins, but a lot of metabolites using the, the world of solid state NMR spectroscopy. Okay, hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, thanks Gary for that introduction leading into me. Um, I will talk about a whole bunch of different things. Mainly, uh, we'll start with how we are different uh, in the solid state versus a solution state in liquids. Um, we'll go through what kind of samples um, do I typically look at? And then we'll, I'll go through a couple of different uh, experiments and examples on some of these. Um, so for solid state NMR at uh, an EMSL, um, you'll mainly be dealing with uh, myself or uh, Sarah Burton. And we always uh, collaborate. So if we need help, we, we pull in other people from uh, outside of EMSL. Um, but we are more than willing to uh, work with everyone. And there we go. What are the differences? So everyone before has shown these nice sharp lines and everything's in solution. And why is that? Um, these samples, when they're in solution, they basically, these they're like little bar magnets. They end up flipping around and they're tumbling at, at such a fast rate. You're getting an average um, to that uh, orientation to that species. In the solid, or even if you have a very viscous solution, you, you'll start to see it where the tumbling slows down and you'll get these broader lines. In the solid, they're fixed in these orientations. And in the end, I, I, I'm not going to show you all the quantum mechanics about it, but there are, there are all these anisotropic interactions that start coming into play that are no longer averaged out in solution. And if you look at the chemical shift, for example, we've, we've got a single crystal here. And if I rotate that single crystal in the magnetic field, the chemical shift just starts walking around. And if I had a powder, if I grind it up into a powder, it'll trace out what we call a powder pattern. And, and we can extract things from this. And if I have a single spin, like in this cadmium compound, um, it was very easy to analyze. The, uh, everything traces out. And, and if you have a mixture, though, or more than one nuclei of interest, like in all the molecules you know, that we showed before, these get complicated very fast. And it's, and it's hard to disentangle these. Um, so what can we do for these things? And naturally, uh, my one piece of math and equation on here is, is wrong. So that Q should be a theta. Uh, most of these anisotropic interactions end up with the uh, this dependent orientation dependence in them. So keep three cos squared theta minus one. If we can make that term, all these, all these interactions have this common term. If we could make that go to zero somehow, they would go away. And back in, I think, the 1950s, uh, it was discovered that if you could average things such that you were spinning about the, an angle theta of 54.7 to 4 degrees, most of these interactions zeroed out. So somebody cleverly called this magic. It, it was the magic angle spinning experiment. So if you hear MAS or magic angle spinning, this is why it's magic. It's because everything all of a sudden just goes to zero if you hit this just right. Uh, an example on here, uh, again, the same cadmium. I took the chemical shift 
made the powder spectrum. And if I spin it, getting slowly increasing more faster speeds, you can see the, uh, the spinning sidebands start to trace out what the line shape is. And eventually what you're left with is just the chemical shift. So this, this is not a good example for practicality. I mean, here you can see I'm spinning at 20 kilohertz already. And for most samples that's, that's and probes, that's not realistic. Um, but for, for cadmium, it's a, quite a large chemical shift range for carbon. Not so much, it, it's, it's much more manageable. And let's go on. Before I do that really quickly, here's what one of these probes looks like. So instead of the typical NMR tube, we have a little tiny piece of ceramic that goes inside this little spinner right here. And we spin this super fast in the uh, magnetic field. Now, what do these samples look like? Here's an, a, a blow up here. Of, this is what we call our NMR rotor. <clears throat> we will put these samples inside the, uh, these sample holders. And there's every vendor has their own unique design, uh, designed to spin really fast. Uh, we're not gonna go into that. Um, Mostly what we like to do is we like to deal in powders. So if we can crush it up, that, that's uh, what we like to do. So right here, I've, I've got uh, a sample of uh, charred uh, plant matter and we've just crushed it into a nice fine powder so I can pack it into that rotor. But I also deal with the tissue as well. I mean, here's a sample of uh, maize, uh, a young seedling that was grown uh, on carbon 13 labeled media. Excuse me. And the uh, what we do is that we chop that up really finely and then stuff that into the same rotor and we get a nice, uh, beautiful carbon spectrum. Now, so we have complex mixtures. Those are our soils and our char. Uh, we have uh, mineral bound uh, materials. Uh, we have mobile samples. Again, these cell walls. I mean, as you can imagine, if you take a uh, a plant like, uh, say, a leaf of spinach you know, on your cutting board and you chop it up, you can feel how wet and, 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 and what that material feels like. That's beautiful for us. That, that keeps these samples hydrated and keeps them mobile. And that, that brings back some of that motion we, we need to, uh, to help narrow up some of these lines. And, and, and I added back mineral bound protein. Uh, some of these can be tethered, but if they get the right level of hydration around them, they, again, you can get nice narrow lines. Uh, some of that uh, dynamics that Gary was talking about earlier. Uh, we also deal in uh, semi-solids um, where I have uh, algae or my microbial mats. I'm just rehydrating those. I mean, again, it's, it's like goo, uh, the, again, plant material. I mean, I'm taking some uh, uh, plant cell wall material and uh, swollen it with the uh, uh, solvent and made a gel out of it. Uh, it's not suitable for liquids because it's still very viscous and very solid. But when we spin it in the magic angle, we get nice, beautiful spectrum. And I'll show some of that later. Um, and swollen soils, again, the, uh, if you've heard uh, something called an HRMAS probe, um, it's high resolution magic angle spinning. And it's, and it's mainly to swell these samples with, with solvents, either D2O, DMSO, and try to induce some of that mobility back into the sample, even though the whole, the, the minerals aren't gonna move, but some of the carbon on there will. And let's see, mixed phase, I, I will show some things where we have uh, solid substrate, uh, we have gas with it, um, we have gas capture, and, and we've also done some um, ice nucleation uh, experiments to start with. So we're, we're, we're looking at exploring and getting into that, and I'll show you how that's done. And how am I doing on time? I'm gonna try to keep the watch on time to keep everybody from taking their lunch. All right, complex mixtures. Um, mostly what we do at EMSL is we're very interested in, uh, in soil materials. Um, there's a project we had with uh, Mary Firestone at Berkeley and her group. And they were interested in uh, basically following a carbon CO2 label through a plant into the rhizosphere. And they were very interested in, in how it interacted with the different minerals. And their experimental design, they had uh, mineral packets of, of pure minerals, which if we see it, they basically put that right next to the root system 
have the CO2 flowing through the plant and the uh, root exudates were, were bound to the minerals if they so desired. And then we were able to collect those individually and then do our carbon NMR spectrum. Now, what you saw from uh, Shavian and, uh, and as far as metabolites, the, this is not that. Uh, we do not have that kind of resolution because we are still mineral bound and we don't have that mobility that, that we need. However, what we can do in the solid state is look at different functional groups in different areas. Uh, we can break it down into uh, carbonyl groups, uh, aliphatic groups. And if there's a really sharp resonance here around 30 ppm, we, we know that's in the uh, lipid or cell wall. Uh, there's definitely a region for carbohydrates. So if you're looking at for different sugar regions and, and of course aromatics, and we can start tickling apart things like that. I mean, I've got this table here uh, where we try to break it down even further. And a lot of times we can tell if we have this huge carbonyl peak and a good aliphatic region, we, we know, you know, again, that's, that's more protein being formed. And we can, if we want to explore that further, we can try to extract that out and do some uh, uh, ICR, some, some aspect experiments and try to figure out what we, we got on these. Um, and if you look at some of these minerals, you know, yeah, yeah, quartz did not pick up that much on the organics. If we did an extra analysis, Turns out ferry hydrate does pick up a lot of organics, but you'll notice the carbon spectrum is terrible. Um, that's because, as Shay mentioned, the paramagnetics uh, do not work very well in the NMR magnet. Uh, well, they, they, they work just fine, I should say. The carbon attached relaxed way too fast. Um, and I'm being told to hurry it up and get off, so I will get race through these. Um, again, we've done some plant cell walls, and I, you can see I get some of the nice pretty 2Ds that everyone has, where we can do structures and then try to define these uh, interactions. Uh, let's see, we've got some uh, same kind of HSQCs we talked about on the uh, cell walls. Here's some of the things I want, want to hire, highlight is developed in, in EMSL, the sealed rotor systems uh, for doing in-situ reaction chemistry. Um, we've got some where we've done lignin, lignin uh, reactions and cellulose degradation. Uh, we've done some uh, gas captured in pores, describing uh, how we measure the pore size and flow between the pores. Um, we have also done uh, CO2 capture in, in this particular experiment. And again, as I was mentioning before, we've got some ice nucleation uh, where we can talk about different uh, proton species being formed as the uh, more and more water is, is collecting into clusters. And I will leave that up. So now we have some time for questions. Sorry. Hey, it's all good. Thank you, Andy. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just want to make sure we can uh, get to a couple of them before our time ends here. Um, if all of the speakers can come back on camera, um, we will start our Q&A. Um, and yeah, so I, I guess I'll start with the first one, and I believe it is directed towards Che. So Che, uh, Leng Leng Li actually had two questions for you. One is if the metabolites were extracted in a water or in an H2O field, do I need to dry out all the water in a freeze dryer or can I just dissolve the solution into a, a D2O and measure that directly? So that's first so, one. So what we can do is we can directly measure it. So if you collected, um, if you extracted metabolites in water, what we can do is take just a little bit of that, and then we can spike in D2O into that sample. So you would need to do that on your end. That was something we kind of do here. We just spiking about 10% D2O, and then we would put that on an NMR instrument and analyze that. So you wouldn't have to do any additional sample processing. Great. Second one is in comparing um, LCMS and GCMS, which is better in identifying and quantifying untargeted primary and secondary metabolites? All of them. 
And the reason I say all of them is because no, like I said in the last slide, no one method is going to give you the complete picture of the metabolome. They all have their benefits and their drawbacks. And what I like to say, for example, is NMR, you're really going to get those dissolved VOCs. You're going to get those small molecular weight compounds. You're going to get quantitation. Um, but LCMS tends to give more identifications in general. But one example of where LCMS kind of falls short, for example, is it doesn't really, our current methods doesn't separate all isomers. So that's where you get GCMS is better for that. And NMR is really good for that. And, um, um, NMR helped us determine whether that the compound we have was alanine or beta alanine. I couldn't tell that by the mass spec. And so I was assigning that wrong incorrectly. Um, and NMR was able to say, hey, no, that, that's not what that is. That's actually um, alanine. So that's just an example where they all work together. We kind of work with users. If you're looking for a specific target metabolites, we'll tell you which technique can give you the answer that you're looking for. But if you really want untargeted and global, all three would be my suggestion. All right. Um, so Kimber Moreland is asking, and, and I don't know who can answer this, so I'm pitching it out there. Um, have you done pyogenic carbon in soils? And if so, is there a desirable method, proton, 13C, solid, liquid? Yeah, it's probably a lot of solids for the soils. Um, Definitely not proton. Um, what's going to end up happening with proton is it, it as we've saw, that it's, it's the most abundant spin. I mean, it's, and all the protons will talk to every other proton. And it, you basically end up with this giant Gaussian line. So you, it's hard to get information from that under most circumstances. So carbon is very nice. The carbon spectrum would, would work. We're done, and we've done some uh, of these materials. Um, you probably will also want to end up using some uh, EPR, which we haven't talked about because we, we really had, didn't have enough time for what we talked about. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Andy, this is another one for you. So Meg, uh, Meg Kian Zhu is asking, um, so in Mary Firestone's work, um, would the iron atom in mineral uh, fair hydrate interfere or fairy hydrate interfere with the carbon NMR data collection and analysis? Yeah, that, that's what I was trying to get to. Um, because of the paramagnetics in there, the uh, the, the iron spin state is it, predominantly par paramagnetic and fairy hydrate. Um, as Gary said, I mean, it, it shifts the chemical shift of the carbon spectrum. It's, it's moved all over the place. Um, we also have a problem with uh, relaxation. So it's almost too fast to, to detect because the, uh, as, we, as we pulse into it and you saw the FID that John showed that goes nice, nice long, with the paramagnetics, that thing relaxes down to almost nothing really fast, which makes your line really broad. Um, and I didn't talk about most of the experiments we do are what's called cross polarization. So we take the abundant proton spin bath and enhance our carbon signal by dumping that into the uh, carbons. Well, we need, it takes time to make the that transfer and that paramagnetics just totally kills that interaction. So it's, we're, it's a lose-lose for us for most of these uh, systems when we have that much paramagnetics in there. Yeah. Um, so Donnie Day had a, a question that Che answered in the chat, but I, I wanna quickly mention it. And then uh, we have time for just one more question. Um, that is directed towards Andy. So um, hang on. So Donnie asked, is it best to directly contact individuals for protocols or are, they, or are individuals available on the EMSA website for targeted analysis? Um, and uh, Che's recommendation is to go ahead and contact um, scientists here. <laughs> um, so the, the website provides a pretty general overview, but the folks on this call today um, can give you some um, really great information. Correct, Che? Yep. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. And Andy, one last question for you. So, and we got to make this quick. Uh, what would be the reason to hydrate soils for swollen measurements? I saw that switchgrass is considered a swollen, sw a swollen soil, but what about highly organic soils like peat? Yeah, I mean, it, I don't remember if I said that. I don't, I don't think mean to apply the switchgrass was a swollen soil. I, I swelled it to try to get, again, some more liquid state type uh, NMR experiments. Um, it was not necessary. I mean, I've done some labeled switchgrass um, by itself, just cut up, and it's, it's fairly well hydrated. Um, but for soils, what we can do is if we swell it up with a D2O, we're going to go for the hydrophilic uh, sites, and we'll we try to pick apart which spectrum is hydrophilic. If you swell it with, say, a DMSO, you're going to pick up some things that are hydrophobic. So it's, it's just a way to try to pull this complicated spectrum apart again. Yeah. Um, and with that, we're at one o'clock. So I want to thank all of our presenters today. Um, and thank you, folks out in um, the world for joining us and learning more about EMSL's NMR capabilities. So we hope to see you back here next month. Uh, for more information on our future open calls uh, that will be um, announced in December. So with that, thank you everyone. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.